Good morning. Today's class is on influence of systemic disorders on periodontium. So there's two parts in it. The part one considers the uh, influence of systemic disorders related to the sex hormones. So learning outcomes include analyzing the effects of sex hormones on periodontium, analyze the different types of gingival changes in puberty, pregnancy and menopause. The contents of the lecture would include introduction, pubertal gingivitis, menstrual gingivitis, pregnancy gingivitis, menopausal gingival stomatitis and use of contraceptives and then we'll finish it with conclusion. Uh, to start with, women due to changes that occur in their bodies, that is puberty, pregnancy or menopause, have increased hormonal fluctuation as opposed to men. These changes in women's hormonal milieu are reflected in their periodontal tissue throughout her life, increasing the risk of periodontal diseases. Periodontal and oral tissue responses may be altered, creating diagnostic and therapeutic dilemmas. Therefore, it's imperative that the clinician recognizes, customizes and appropriately alters the periodontal therapy according to the individual women's needs based on the stage of her life cycle it's, uh, based on their on her life cycle so uh, starting with the uh, first one that is the pubertal uh, gingivitis so uh, we will go on with the etiology uh, so i would like to make it uh, clear here that if you are going to write about any etiology if you want to explain about any etiology of any condition it is always better that you explain it in the form of a flow chart rather than writing in paragraphs because it is going to be easier for you also to understand and easier for the person who is uh, who is intended to listen to you also so uh, coming on to puberty gingivitis so why does this occur why does gingivitis occur during this time um, uh, the reasons being that there is an increased level of estrogen and progesterone during this time this increases the blood flow to the gingiva uh, raising the sensitivity as well as reaction to the irritants uh, especially there is more amount of privatella intermedia here this is because privatella intermedia uh, thrives mainly on vitamin K growth factor, Privatella intermedia thrives mainly on vitamin K growth factor, um, but uh, this vitamin K growth factor, uh, it has uh, the ovarian hormones has a similar structure as that of the vitamin K growth factor. Since these hormones increase during this time period, Privatella assumes that uh, ovarian hormones are the vitamin K growth factors and tends to become uh, tends to multiply more on them. So apart from uh, Privatella intermedia, you do have Privatella nigrescens, Capnocytophaga, motel rods as well as pyrochates. So uh, how do you differentiate uh, gingivitis from a pubertal gingivitis? So uh, generally this kind, kind of condition occurs at an average age of 11 to 14 years. They show an exaggerated response to the local factors and uh, th these five conditions that is this inflamed tissue is erythematous, lobulated, retractable, feels tender and bleeds easily. So this uh, conditions uh, in a 11 to 14 years of girl should trigger you the idea that it could be a pubertal gingivitis. You could also see that uh, histologically that there is an inflammatory hyperplasia. Sometimes gingival enlargement could be present. Uh, it has been found by studies that the increased bleeding tendency during puberty is because of the bacteria capnocytophaga. So what is the management? Preventive care including vigorous program of oral hygiene maintenance is vital. Uh, mild gingivitis like for example uh, in the, those cases uh, just scaling and root planing is sufficient with frequent oral hygiene uh, reinforcement whereas in severe cases microbial culturing antimicrobial mouthwashes and local drug delivery or antibiotic therapy is required gingival enlargement in puberty is treated by scaling and cure attach removing all the irritants and controlling plaque surgical removal may be required in severe cases uh, when gingival enlargement is there so the next is about uh, the next phase that is your uh, menstrual gingivitis. So before going into the uh, menstrual uh, gingivitis and the conditions, I would like to tell about what are the hormones which are mainly involved in a female's life, especially during the menstrual cycle. So you under the influence of the gonadotropin releasing hormone, the anterior pituitary gland releases the luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone. Under the influence of the luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, 
the ovary produces the estrogen and progesterone and these are responsible for uh, uh, umpteen number of changes in a female's uh, uh, body so these also cause uh, changes in the gingiva so uh, the menstrual cycle has been divided into two different phases that is the first phase is your follicular phase and the second phase is your luteal phase so during the follicular phase you could see more amount of follicle stimulating hormone and estrogen present whereas during the luteal phase you have more amount of progesterone and more amount of uh, estrogen which is present so it, you could see that during the luteal phase it peaks to around 0.2 nanogram per ml and progesterone 10 nanogram per ml so this increase uh, of hormones results in increase in the inflammation to the gingival tissues and this exaggerates the response to the local irritants so mainly uh, the increase inflammation or gingivitis which is occurring during the uh, menstrual period is due to an increase in the uh, estrogen uh, in, during the menstrual cycle is due to an increase in the estrogen and the progesterone so um, again uh, not only that you do have several other reasons for the uh, increase in the uh, gingival inflammation uh, during uh, the uh, menstrual cycle it could be a fluctuation of the tnf alpha during the menstrual cycle elevated pge2 synthesis androgenetic factors and endothelial growth factors and modulation of the receptors by estrogen and progesterone apart from uh, many other activities progesterone uh, plays an important role uh, where it produces certain changes in the gingival tissues like for example it increases the permeability of the vasculature it alters the rate and pattern of collagen production in the gingiva alters the neutrophil chemotaxis and results in stimulation of the prostaglandin production estrogen on the other hand increases the cell proliferation in the blood vessels and decreases the keratinization so all these changes together lead to increase in the gingival inflammation so basically it leads to gingivitis coming on to the clinical manifestations so this is uh, seen as gingival bleeding redness or swelling of the uh, gingiva and it could you could have sores on the inside of the lip and the cheek burning sensation and increase of gingival exudate so uh, there is another syndrome called as premenstrual syndrome which occurs just before the uh, ovulation period when there is an uh, uh, just before the menstrual cycle uh, 10 days before it where the patients are more sensitive less tolerant of procedures and have a heightened gag reflex they may even have an exaggerated response to pain so all these reactions are not uh, patients uh, not the patient's own fault it could be because of the increase in the estrogen and progesterone that the patient is behaving a little less tolerant uh, to the procedures which we are going to do so understanding them during this particular period is very important uh, management oral hygiene uh, maintenance is essential including uh, home oral hygiene and regular professional dental care patients physician should be considered consulted and hormonal level should be monitored Periodontal maintenance should be titrated to the individual patient's knee and antimicrobial oral rinse before the cyclic inflammation may be indicated. In cases of history of excess postoperative hemorrhage or menstrual flow, scheduling surgical visits after cyclic inflammation is prudent. So since there is a lot of blood loss present, anemia is common in these individuals and appropriate consultation with physician and recent lab tests should be maintained. So coming on to uh, pregnancy, the say third stage. Uh, so here you do have a condition called as pregnancy gingivitis, which would, which could occur in the female. So uh, you you could see that in the in, during the time of pregnancy, the amount of estrogen and progesterone are way higher than that which was found during the menstrual cycle. So it is uh, it, it is uh, shown by studies that progesterone increases to around 10 times that during the menstrual cycles around 100 nanogram per ml of progesterone is present whereas estrogen increases to around 30 times its level that during the menstrual cycle so because of these changes this accentuates the gingival response to the plaque so uh, ordinary um, women if they have a uh, little amount of plaque present they would not respond very easily to it 
whereas in pregnant individual responds very easily to it and results in gum bleeding and other conditions associated with the gingivitis so what could be the um, etiology for uh, the gingival responses to the elevated estrogen and progesterone levels in the body so one thing is that there is a change in the subgingival plaque composition that is there is an increase in the anaerobic aerobic ratio which means there is more number of anaerobes which are being formed so anaerobes such as privatella intermedia so as i told already privatella intermedia substitutes the ovarian hormones for the vitamin k growth factor and starts thriving on them higher concentrations of bacteroides melanogenicus and higher concentration of p gingivalis is present on the other hand maternal immune response is very low so uh, what ha happens is that uh, the cell mediated immunity of the mother is low neutrophil chemotaxis is less antibody and t cell responses are less cd4 cd8 count is less the stimulation of the prostaglandin synthesis and therefore the host response is low the plaque uh, the bacterial action is high and therefore there is going to be a play uh, where gingival response is elevated uh, to the plaque present apart from this the sex hormones also play a role where estrogen increases the cellular proliferation in the blood vessels and decreases the keratinization whereas progesterone increases the vascular dilatation thus the permeability and proliferation of the newly formed capillaries in the gingival tissues alters the rate and pattern of the collagen production and uh, decrease plasminogen activator inhibitor type 2 is present thus increases the tissue proteolysis both of them together could cause affect the ground substance of the connective tissue by increasing the fluidity and um, increased concentration of them is present in saliva as well as serum now coming on to its um, clinical manifestations pregnancy gingivitis um, it is seen to it is shown that 30 to 100% of all pregnancy uh, women uh, have this condition and it usually starts in the second or the third month and it gets worsened by the eighth month it accentuates the gingival response resulting to uh, resulting in increased inflammation to the uh, plug not only that gingiva shows changes sometimes even the tongue lips buccal mucosa and palate do show certain changes uh, which is present as so, changes such as erythema edema hyperplasia ease of bleeding tenderness of gingiva pocket formation and transient mobility could be present gingival changes are usually painless unless they are complicated by acute infection increase in attachment level uh, could be present uh, in the active stage and more of the anterior region of the mouth and the interproximal sites are being involved so if present along with mouth breathing uh, the patient can give rise to pregnancy rhinitis microscopically you can see certain changes in the gingival tissues where the epithelium is hyperplastic with reduced keratinization and uh, there is an accentuated rete plaques you can see elongated rete plaques rete pigs which are present and uh, there is also a marked inflammatory cell infiltration which occurs with edema and degeneration of the gingival epithelium now uh, there could be sometimes gingival enlargement in the pregnant individuals so why does this occur uh, occur and again here you do have the etiology this is mainly because of the increased level of progesterone and estrogen at the end of the third trimester as i told you already progesterone increases 10 times that level during the menstrual cycle estrogen increases 30 times the level during the menstrual cycle and therefore this induces changes in the vascular permeability resulting in gingival edema resulting in an increase inflammatory response to the dental plaque not only that there is an increase in the privatella intermedia so because of all these factors you do have gingival enlargement in pregnancy so this gingival enlargement could be of two types it could be either a marginal gingival enlargement or it could be a tumor like one so marginal gingival enlargement as you can see in the picture is more prominent interproximally bright red in color magenta or magenta color bleeding occurs spontaneously or even on slight provocation whereas 
tumor-like enlargement is also known as pregnancy upillus or the pregnancy granuloma. This is a discrete mushroom-like flattened spherical mass that protrudes from the interproximal area. This could be either sessile as shown in the picture like this or it could be either pedunculatum. It is generally dusky red or magenta. It has a smooth glistening surface that often exhibits numerous deep red pinpoint markings. Now, uh, the next condition that is uh, periodontal disease and preterm low birth weight infants. So, uh, often Becker, he had told that untreated pregnant, uh, untreated periodontal diseases in pregnant women could be a risk factor for preterm and low birth weight individuals. So, what is preterm? That is, if an infant or infant fetus is comes out within 37 weeks of gestation, be below 37 weeks of gestation, then it is considered to be a preterm labor. If the uh, infant is less than 2500 grams, then it is considered to be low birth weight. So, you could ask me how uh, periodontal disease results in um, or increases the risk for the uh, preterm low birth weight individuals. So according to him, uh, that is often backer, he has told that there could be a biological plausibility of uh, translocation of the periodontal pathogens th through the blood to the amniotic fluid. Uh, not only that, there could be effects of endotoxins, that is the lipopolysaccharides of the bacteria and effect of inflammatory mediators which results in inflammation and therefore the complement pathway gets activated with the activation of the interleukin 8 and TNF alpha. This results in the production of the prostonoids. Prostonoids uh, generally their action is to increase the uh, uterine contractions. So if this occurs early then it results in preterm birth. Again prostonoids gets divided into proteases and this also results in premature rupture of the membrane resulting in preterm birth. So this is how uh, he came to a conclusion that uh, both of them have a connection. So not only that, uh, he has also told that uh, the bacterial byproducts could and the pro-inflammatory mediators could uh, from the periodontal uh, tissues could go into the uh, hematogenous spread and enter the uh, amniotic fluid and be, can be found in the amniotic fluid when tested. So it has been shown that bacterial infection um, from any part of the body as for that sense could the result produce bacteria and its pro products uh, in the amnion resulting in inflammatory response with cytokine production in amnion with increased amniotic prostaglandin production resulting in preterm labor. Uh, there were certain authors who have also found out that uh, Fusobacterium nucleatum has been linked to uh, the preterm low birth weight uh, infants. Uh, there was another author called Jeff Court where he had shown and proved that scaling and root planing in pregnant female reduced the incidence of preterm uh, birth and uh, he had done a study on uh, pregnant women where he had carried on the scaling and root planing during the second trimester and came to this conclusion. So there is another condition in the pregnant women called as preeclampsia which is characterized by hypertension and proteinuria after uh, week 20 of gestation. Here uh, th through the studies it was shown that periodontal disease increases uh, the risk of preeclampsia by around 2 to 2 point folds and therefore it is needed to control the periodontal disease. Uh, periodontal disease and gestational diabetes too have a connection. So what is gestational diabetes? It is a condition in which the woman de de without diabetes develops a high blood sugar level during her pregnancy. So inflammation caused by periodontal disease might interfere with the proper insulin function and therefore there is a high blood sugar level. So it is always necessary to control the periodontal disease especially in a female individual during her pregnancy. So coming on to the management, uh, the main thing is reiterating to them about the oral hygiene maintenance and uh, getting an optimal oral hygiene maintenance level in these individuals. A complete medical history has to be recorded. Preventive periodontal treatment which uh, uh, includes nutritional counseling as well as rigorous plaque controls in dental office and home is required. Scaling, polishing and wood planing may be performed during pregnancy but 
try to avoid it during the first trimester that is the first three months because there could be a, ch a chance of because there is organogenesis taking place formation of organs taking place so any small disturbance could lead to uh, a major change in the uh, uh, tissue changes or the formation of the organs and try to avoid it during the last half of the third trimester this is because uh, of the hazard of premature delivery excess because even with very light stimuli to the external uh, factors the premature delivery could occur so avoid it to do during the last third trimester so the best time to carry on with the dental treatment would be the second trimester uh, in these individuals try to avoid prolonged chat time uh, procedures this is because they do have have a syndrome called a supine hypotensive syndrome where um, in these individuals you could see this diagram where uh, the growing fetus uh, when the patient is lying in a supine position tends to uh, compress the vena cava as well as the iota here so in these individuals try to um, reverse them on the left side by removing the pressure on the vena cava as well as iota by placing a preventive 6 inch soft wedge uh, which should be placed on the patient's right side when she is inclined for treatment. As I told you already, second trimester is the safest period for providing routine and emphasis at this time is on controlling the active disease and eliminating the potential problems that could arise in late pregnancy. So um, there is a various doubts whether radiographs can be taken in, the, in these individuals. So it is always better that you avoid radiographs during the first trimester. Uh, lead apron should be used whenever using thereafter. X-ray film should be taken selectively during the pregnancy patient uh, as and when necessary. In most cases, bite wing, panoramic or selective PA films are indicated. Coming on to uh, taking of or prescribing medications. Ideally, no drug should be prescribed in medication, especially during the first trimester. But antibiotics are necessary for periodontal therapy. And therefore, uh, whenever you are giving, be particular about the type of antimicrobial you are using, the dosage, trimester and duration of course of therapy. Drugs which are belonging to the category A, uh, control studies in humans uh, show no risk to the fetus that is uh, those category of drugs under A uh, when given has shown that there is no risk to the fetus present. Uh, category B drugs there is no control studies which have been conducted in humans but animal studies have shown no risk to the fetus. Category C drugs no control studies have been conducted both in animals and humans. Category D drugs evidence of human risk is present to the fetus. So uh, please uh, avoid certain drugs, uh, these drugs, uh, however benefits may outweigh the risks in certain situations. So in those cases you can give it but uh, try to avoid it 90%. And uh, the category X kind of drugs totally avoid it because control studies in both the animals and humans they demonstrate fetal abnormalities. So try to avoid this at most. Uh, so there are uh, certain drugs which have been put forward by authors where they have done their studies and come to a conclusion. Antibiotic administration during pregnancy of penicillin, erythromycin and clindamycin is found to be very safe and uh, the drug tetracycline is found to have a D category that is there is more fetus risk present. The, the fetus risk is that there is depression of the bone growth, enamel hyperplasia and gave grey brown tooth discoloration and therefore avoid this drug. Apart from this avoid the clarithromycin also. Local anesthesia which could be prescribed safe during the pregnancy is lidocaine. Please avoid long acting local anesthesia like bukivicaine. Uh, coming on to analysis so always the best and safest would be your paracetamol that is your acetaminophen. Please avoid aspirin as well as ibuprofen, category D drugs there, so please avoid them. And uh, totally avoid any sedatives during the uh, pregnancy and uh, uh, avoid aspirin during breastfeeding. Now coming to, coming on to the uh, treatment algorithm for the pregnant patient. So if you if a woman of childbearing age or pregnant patient comes, uh, proper oral hygiene, periodontal examination or charting is required 
review the effects of the female hormones on the periodontium, the possible effects of periodontal inflammation on the unborn fetus and periodontal maintenance and categorize them into uh, either they are periodontally stable pregnant patients or they are pregnant patients with inflammation. If they are periodontally sa a stable preg pregnant patient, then the safest to treat during the second trimester like very minimal procedures like scaling and others. Uh, followed by periodontal maintenance, avoid category C or D drugs. But uh, if the patient is a pregnant patient with inflammation, consult their doctors and then debridement is preferred in the second trimester. But if it's, if uh, if you need any further treatment, you can carry on for the patient uh, provided the benefit outweighs the risk and avoid category C and D medications. Now coming into the next phase in a women's life that is menopausal, menopausal condition and um, the condition associated along with it is a menopausal gingival stomatitis. So menopause is a cessation of the menstruation and this occurs at around uh, 40 to uh, 45 to 50 years of age. Menopause is associated with symptoms of estrogen deficiency. During menopause, estrogen levels fall while uh, the follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone levels raises. This fluctuation of hormones have been implicated as factors in inflammatory changes in gingival hypertrophy and atrophy. Estrogen affects the cell proliferation, differentiation and keratinization of the gingival epithelium. So during menopause, it is seen that you will be having dry and shiny mucosa, thinning of the oral mucosa, burning mouth, pain, gingival recession, xerostomia, altered taste and alveolar bone loss and rigid resorption. That is osteopenia as well as osteoporosis. Here osteopenia is a reduction in the bone mass caused by an imbalance between the bone resorption and the formation favoring resorption and resulting in demineralization. Osteoporosis is a disease characterized by low bone mass and fragility and a consequent increase in fracture risk. So this uh, in the uh, oral cavity has been reflected as uh, less mandibular and maxillary bone mineral density, tooth loss, alveolar ridge atrophy and clinical periodontal attachment loss is present. So uh, in studies have shown that when hormone replacement therapy is done, that is when estrogen is being replaced uh, for the loss of estrogen in these individuals, they showed that there was an increased alveolar bone mass associated with improved alveolar crustal height, reduced clinical attachment loss or reduced periodontal inflammation has been seen when patients have been given estrogen as supplements or replacement. So coming into the management, medical history should be reviewed. So coming on to the management, medical history should be reviewed. If gingival or nucleosal thickening occurs, soft tissue augmentation may be performed. Brushing with an extra soft tissue is recommended, which may prevent scrubbing the thin gingiva. Dentifices with minimal abrasives and rinses with low alcohol concentration are to be used. Root surfaces should be debrided gently with minimal soft tissue trauma and close monitoring of the patient's periodontal stability and perform titrated periodontal maintenance. Inform the patient about the potential risks of hormone depletion on oral mucosa and advise to consult the treating physician. So in patients receiving hormonal replacement therapy, uh, it has been found that the oral symptoms and the tooth loss are significantly reduced. In patients who are susceptible to osteoporosis, dentists should consult the patient's physician regarding about the hormone replacement therapy. Uh, and uh, calcium supplementation along with it. So it is recommended that uh, for a premenopausal woman, 1000 milligram of calcium per day is required, whereas for a postmenopausal woman, 1500 milligram of calcium per day is required. Now coming on to the oral contraceptive pills, uh, usage and how it uh, acts, uh, its components acts on the gingival tissues. So it has been shown that oral contraceptive use mimics the hormonal levels of pregnancy that is it results in increased estrogen and progesterone formation. This prevents the LS surge uh, and this prevents ovulation and therefore uh, there could be certain changes in the gingiva also occurring. So the uh, oral contraceptive associated gingiva inflammation may become chronic because of the extended periods that women are exposed to uh, to the elevated levels of estrogen and progesterone. 
so you could see that there is an uh, inflammation which is mild uh, where there is mild edema or erythema to severe inflammation hemorrhagic or hyperplastic gingival tissues uh, and more x-ray is present there is an increased response due to an uh, increase altered by my microvasculature increased gingival permeability and prostaglandin synthesis here uh, there is an increase in the uh, bacteroids due to the female sex organ substituting for naphthoquinone naphthoquinone is a requirement for the presence of bacteroids gingival melanosis is present and change in salivary height composition and localized osteitis could be present so always inform about the oral and the periodontal side effects of oral contraceptive to the patient and the need for meticulous oral uh, hygiene maintenance with periodontal maintenance establish an oral hygiene program and elimination of local predisposing factors periodontal surgery may be indicated if the resolution after initial therapy is inadequate it may be advisable to perform uh, the extraction of the teeth on the non estrogenic days that is day 23 to 28 of the uh, cycle menstrual cycle to reduce the risk of post operative localized osteitis so to conclude i would like to tell that the cyclic nature of the female sex hormone often is reflected in the tissues as an initial sign and symptom medical history and dialogues should include a thoughtful investigation of the individual patient problem and needs questioning should reflect the hormonal stability and medications associated with the regulation patient should be educated regarding the profound effects the sex hormones may play on the periodontal and oral tissues as well as the consistent need for home home and office removal of local irritants thank you